and we're recording session number 27 of New Testament survey. We're in the book of Acts and we'll begin today at chapter 13. Chapter 13 of Acts is the, the major transition of we've already been introduced to Paul uh, the persecutor of the church and then converted on the Damascus road and the, the teacher at uh, uh, Antioch. All of this has taken 15 years. And so we're moving along in, uh, in the book of Acts. The uh, story picks up in Antioch of Syria with Paul's first missionary journey. Uh, Paul is going to take three official missionary journeys and then a fourth trip, which takes him to Rome. Uh, and these are the, the main events of the rest of the book of Acts. Uh, it's not completely simple to uh, take apart the, um, the various missionary journeys. Uh, the first one is fairly simple, uh, but beyond that, uh, they they kind of run together. Paul was always traveling. Uh, he was always uh, getting kicked out of one place and set up in another place. And uh, along the way, he picks up Dr. Luke. Uh, we're not sure exactly where Luke comes from. Luke is a Gentile. Uh, and uh, we see him popping up in uh, Paul's ministry during the second journey as, uh, as Paul is getting ready to go over to Greece. Uh, so it's, it's an actually entirely possible that uh, Luke was a Greek and um, uh, joined with Paul uh, halfway through this and uh, picked up on the rest of his research after this time. It's all kind of interesting, kind of, uh, kind of fun stuff. Let me uh, open up the uh, screen share. Oh boy, let's see if I can get it right. Do everything I'm supposed to here. Yes, there it is. Uh, so book five of uh, the book of Acts takes us from the end of chapter 12 uh, all the way into chapter 16. Uh, by the time we get to chapter 16, uh, we'll be uh, done with the, uh, with the uh, first missionary journey and the Jerusalem Council. Uh, so some fairly important stuff coming up. What Paul is doing in this chapter is the first stage of taking the gospel uh, out to the Gentiles in the West. The rest of the book of Acts takes us into the West uh, and is the, the beginning of a long journey that's eventually going to take the church all over the world. Uh, it, I find it fascinating, I've mentioned this before, uh, that the book of Acts doesn't follow the apostles who went East. And we know they did, uh, and that the church was uh, a major influence in the East. But in the West, we, we see Paul as the, the representative of all of the apostles who took the gospel out to the uttermost parts of the earth. Uh, they began that process. Um, the uh, book of Acts takes Paul as its central character. This story is going to begin in, and let me find my cursor. This story is going to begin in uh, Antioch and uh, it's going to take us through the island of Cyprus. Uh, and let's see if I can find this. Uh, end of uh, uh, chapter 12, Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem. Uh, when they had completed their service, which was in Jerusalem as, as ministers from Antioch, uh, and they brought with them John, whose other name was Mark. So we get the, the listing of the, uh, the first missionary team. 
And yeah, here they are together. Uh, and uh, this is not going to last very long, but the, the three of them are together. Uh, uh, Saul, who is Paul, uh, is uh, really the teacher in the group. He's the, uh, he's the theologian. He will produce uh, all those letters of the New Testament that are so important to us. Uh, that will be his great legacy. Barnabas is an encourager. Barnabas is the, the people person. He, uh, he loves to build up individuals. Uh, and so his interaction with people is invaluable. Uh, uh, Paul and Barnabas actually make a really good team. Uh, Mark is the next generation leader. Uh, he's, uh, he's a younger man. At this point, he's probably in his 30s. Uh, Paul and Barnabas have to both be in their late 40s, early 50s. Uh, they're, not, uh, they're not youngsters anymore. Uh, they, they're getting to be senior leaders in, in the young church. But Mark has not yet gotten to a major position of leadership. He does not seem to be a married man. Uh, we don't know anything about wives for Barnabas or Saul. I, we think neither of them is married. Uh, but Mark certainly is still a single guy. And we don't know a whole lot of his background, except that he eventually is going to write the gospel. Uh, Mark is a, is a complex character, and I find him fascinating. Now, this is 13 and uh, uh, verse 1. There were in the church at Antioch, prophets and teachers, which is really an interesting thing. Uh, the, the church has had a year of training under uh, the apostle Paul. Uh, now here they are in Antioch. There are multiple prophets and multiple teachers. Antioch in Syria will, uh, for the rest of its Christian life, uh, which is frankly up until the time of the Crusades, uh, is, is going to be a major center for Christian uh, academics and ministry, and teaching, uh, and missionary outreach uh, to the whole world. Antioch is a, a fantastically complex and interesting church. And all we can do is scrape the surface today. Uh, what we see here is, first of all, this is a church that supports multiple prophets and multiple teachers. And Barnabas, Simeon, who is also called Niger. So Simeon would be a, uh, probably a black man from North Africa uh, and was considered a, uh, a major teacher in the church. Uh, Lucius of Cyrene, which is also North Africa. Uh, Manaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch. Uh, again, fascinating. Uh, uh, Manaean would have been a wealthy man, a part of the upper class, a nobleman, uh, and of an actual friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and finally Saul. And all of these are considered prophets or teachers, or both at once. Uh, a prophet is one who receives revelation from God for delivery to the church. A teacher is one who uh, takes the word of God as it's been preserved and expounds it for the church. And in this era, there were both prophets and teachers, and sometimes they overlapped. Uh, Paul was both. Uh, the list of uh, 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 this, this list is uh, uh, fascinating. Um, the call of Saul and Barnabas is uh, going to take place in the next, uh, next little bit here. Verse 2, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Now, the critics like to ask, well, how does God uh, speak? How does he speak through the Holy Spirit? What sort of event was this? What sort of experience was this? And the, 
The simple answer is we don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. But all of us who have been seriously involved in a church while making important decisions, particularly ministry decisions, decisions about sending people off for ministry, recognize that there, there, is a, there is an actual movement of God's spirit in the group, uh, particularly in the group of leadership. Uh, when uh, uh, when somebody comes to uh, to our church and says they'd they'd like to go out as missionaries, uh, we take that very seriously, and, and that's a that's an important question because if if God is in fact calling somebody from our church to go out as missionaries, then He's also calling the church to support those missionaries. Uh, that's a serious decision. We can't just assume that the call is real. Uh, and so we we wait for the Holy Spirit to make that clear uh, to the whole leadership band. Uh, we're we're not going to hear an audible voice from heaven or an angel on a camel coming through with stone tablets. Um, we're simply going to put two and two together. We're going to connect our dots. Uh, we're going to look at background. We're going to look at uh, the availability of training, of funding, of uh, motivations of people. We're, we're, we're going to see what the possibilities are and wait for the Spirit of God in the background to make it clear to us all. Uh, and it was clear to the church at Antioch. Uh, that Barnabas and Saul were to be set apart for the ministry to which I've called them. And so after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. Now, this, was in, this is what we call the good old days. Uh, modern missionaries, especially American missionaries who want to go overseas, have to apply to a mission board, which is a good thing. Uh, and the mission board can take months and months to decide whether or not they're going to accept them. And then it takes months and months to raise support. And then it takes months and months of training. And then it takes months and months of getting everything else ready and months and months and months to get, you get my point. Uh, here, Saul and Barnabas were set apart by the Holy Spirit. And so the church prayed and fasted and pushed them out the door. Uh, it was all over, uh, we assume, in a matter of days. Now, perhaps it took longer than that to get their bags packed, but they, they were out the door as quick as they could be done. Um, I'll mention just briefly the, uh, the note about fasting here. Uh, we see that they were worshiping and fasting. And later on, they were fasting and praying. It's uh, uh, amazing to modern Christians how often fasting is mentioned in the New Testament uh, as a, a part of the decision-making process or as a part of the worship process or as a part of prayer. Uh, I'm not a big faster. Um, I get hungry. Uh, and, uh, uh, I, I I enjoy my meals, <laughs> so I, I'm not very good. I'm not very good at fasting. We've uh, uh, we've tried that uh, at, at times in the past, and uh, for us, it's not it's not a, a terribly effective thing. Uh, most of the early church did a kind of modified fasting, uh, where uh, they would avoid uh, heavy meals or really uh, big pleasant meals. Uh, one or two days a week, uh, and this may be what we're what we're seeing here. At any rate, uh, fasting is a is a symbol of relying on God alone, and that's not a bad thing. Uh, now, some people like to uh, do that. Okay, I'm just taking care of some technology here. So, beginning at verse four, we see uh, Saul and Barnabas taking off. Away they go. And they're going to head off into Asia Minor. 
by way of uh, Cyprus. Now, this photograph is uh, uh, taken on the island of Cyprus. Let me show you uh, the, uh, the map of uh, uh, Paul's first journey. The Cyprus is this uh, big island that tucks up into the upper right-hand corner of Eastern Mediterranean Sea. You can see on this map, Jerusalem in the uh, lower left-hand corner. Alexandria is in Egypt. And you can see how Alexandria is uh, actually to the west of Cyprus. Caesarea is going to end up being important in the New Testament church uh, story. Uh, and then to the north, you see some important uh, locations. Uh, Northern Syria, you see Antioch, which is actually slightly inland. Its port uh, is not located here or not on this map, but it has a separate port. Aleppo is inland from Antioch. Antioch and Aleppo were, were both important uh, cities on the trade route. Antioch was the actual uh, port merchant city. Uh, Seleucia was the port that Paul used to uh, take off for Cyprus, and that's where they came back. Uh, you'll notice Tarsus, uh, which is in modern Turkey, uh, is not very far from, uh, from Antioch. It's about 75 kilometers uh, overland. Uh, and then we see the, uh, uh, the specific cities on Cyprus. There were two major cities, Salamis and Paphos in uh, biblical times. Today, there are some other cities that are important, but these were the, these were the biblical uh, cities. Uh, from uh, Cyprus, they're going to go up into Asia Minor. Uh, they come through, uh, uh, through Perga in Pamphylia and immediately up to Antioch of Pisidia, then Iconium, Lystra, and Derby, the cities that we call the Galatian churches, <coughs> and then back out again. Uh, that's uh, that's the first journey, and you'll notice it's not uh, it's not a terribly long journey. The <coughs> uh, the whole trip is probably about 800 kilometers. Uh, a lot of it is taken by uh, by boat, and uh, everything on land is done on foot. Uh, so let's uh, let's take a look at the way this thing starts out, beginning in verse four. Uh, we see the events that are going to happen on Cyprus. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, 13.4, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. Now, Luke is really good at uh, uh, locating historical stuff. Uh, and so we get, uh, this is essentially a, uh, uh, a uh, travelogue. Uh, he's going to give us from here, they went to here, and then they went on to this other place, and then to here, and so on. Uh, so off they go to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues, uh, and they had John to assist them. So here's John Mark, and he's going along. It's all in Barnabas, are proclaiming the word of God. Uh, in the Jewish synagogues. Uh, now, Salamis uh, is the uh, uh, easternmost uh, port city on the big island of uh, Cyprus. Uh, Cyprus is a relatively dry place. This photograph that you see is Salamis, uh, and these are Greek columns that would have been on this island uh, at the time of Paul. So Paul very likely walked through this particular forum uh, on his way to the synagogue, uh, which is a kind of a fun thing to think about. You know, wow, <laughs> that's something Paul actually saw. Uh, the, uh, the journey to Cyprus from Seleucia 
is about uh, 50 kilometers, or about 60 kilometers by boat. Uh, and uh, this whole thing is pretty, uh, pretty dry. Uh, the uh, Romans took over the uh, uh, island of uh, Cyprus in 22 BC. And there was a proconsul on the island whose name was Sergius Paulus. And he's going to end up playing a role in uh, this story. So they landed at uh, Cyprus and there was a magician there. So here they are in verse five. Uh, uh, they had uh, uh, gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, which is at the other end of uh, the island of Cyprus, about 100 kilometers away. It's a good long walk. Uh, and uh, they came upon a uh, magician by the name of Bar Jesus. And uh, he, was, uh, he was Jewish, but a false prophet. Uh, he was with the proconsul whose name was Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Eliamus the magician, for that's the meaning of his name, opposed them. So here's the, uh, the setup. You've got uh, uh, this uh, interesting uh, interaction with the, uh, the magician or sorcerer who's called Bar Jesus in Aramaic, or uh, uh, what is his other name? Elemas, which is his Greek name. Uh, and uh, he's, uh, he's a magician, he's a wizard, he's a sorcerer. Uh, generally speaking, he's a, a bad guy. Uh, now, what he's doing in the court of uh, Sergius Paulus uh, is um, he's he's part part of the court official body, the uh, cabinet. Uh, Roman officials would would gather together uh, local, eminent, intelligent people, <laughs> and a lot of these appointments were for political reasons. So. Uh, Eliamus the magician probably had uh, friends in high places uh, who convinced uh, Sergius Paulus uh, that uh, this man should be in the cabinet. And so he would be there and he would be giving advice uh, to uh, Sergius Paulus. Uh, and, uh, it's just not a good thing. Uh, we um, uh, We see that Sergius Paulus is actually uh, an intelligent man. Uh, he's a proconsul. Proconsul means uh, uh, like a vice consul. He's one layer down from consul. Consul was the highest level under the emperor uh, in uh, the actual government of Rome. Now, obviously, there were senators as well, but they were political. Uh, the proconsuls. Uh, were like the Roman governors out in the um, out in the provinces, and they were the actual practical leaders of the Roman government out in the out in the province. So uh, Sergius Paulus would probably be a fairly competent man, uh, and uh, would probably have known uh, that uh, uh, this magician was nobody very important, but he would also know that he was a, a politically powerful. So it's an interesting situation. So we see this going on. Uh, da, 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 da. And uh, uh, okay, meaning of his name. Uh, so we've got uh, Elimus who is opposing uh, Paul and Barnabas, uh, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. So here's an argument going on in verse nine, and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, Paul in verse nine, uh, filled with the Holy Spirit, and who was first called Paul right here, by the way, uh, looked intently at him and said, you son of the devil, but great start, way to influence people, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, uh, will you not stop at making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? 
Uh, the opposition to Christianity in all ages has tried to complicate life uh, for Christian ministry. And one of the ways they do that is by uh, teaching potential converts that Christianity is very complex, it's very hard to understand, you need experts to tell you what this means, uh, and it, it really is not true. Uh, the Bible, I believe, is actually very straightforward, and Christianity is a very straightforward faith. Uh, we believe what the Bible actually says, and then we put those principles into practice in our lives, and it, it ends up being a straightforward moral, ethical life. Uh, without, a, without a lot of mysticism, without a lot of magic, without a lot of dark corners, uh, Christian people are very straightforward people. Uh, and uh, Elamus the magician is trying to make it crooked, make it dark, make it, make it sound dangerous and awful. Uh, and I've had conversations with people who are like this. Uh, and I've always wished I had the courage to call them son of the devil, enemy of righteousness, full of deceit. Uh, Paul is not nearly as diplomatic as I sometimes try to be. Uh, and they said, and now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you. You will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. It immediately, mist and darkness, fell upon him. And he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. <laughs> I love it. Uh, you're you're a blind uh, leader. You're you're going to be blind now. Your your eyes are going to be uh, useless for a, for a time. And so the proconsul believed. Uh, this is uh, uh, this is really a cool thing. Uh, uh, Sergius Paulus. Uh, believed uh, what was uh, what was uh, uh, what he was being told on the basis of what he saw with his own eyes. His own experience demonstrated to him that these men were telling the truth. Uh, and he had known, I suspect, for a good long time, that the the magician Eliamus uh, was a bad guy. Uh, and so Sergius Paulus uh, was ready and waiting. He was, uh, he was happy to hear the truth, and uh, he became a Christian there. Uh, from this point, Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos, uh, which is fascinating. We're not told any more about what they did there. Uh, if, uh, uh, if I had been uh, along for the ride on this story, I think I would have told it in greater detail. Uh, but that's not Luke's style. Uh, for uh, uh, for Luke, as for Paul, the the ministry of church planting is uh, to get in, to make some converts, and let those converts do what the Spirit of God is going to do with them. Uh, Sergius Paulus uh, is going to become the leader of the Cypriot community of Christians. And he'll be a good one. He's an intelligent man. He will eventually pick all of this up. And uh, there will be other teachers who will come by who will fill in the blanks. Sergius Paulus is going to be fine. And along the way, we, uh, we see that Sergius Paulus apparently uh, provided some contacts for Paul in his further ministry. Uh, and uh, uh, that's, that's where he's going next. From Cyprus, they go on to Asia Minor. Uh, and it's, uh, he and his companions set sail to Perga in Pamphylia. And John left them and returned to Jerusalem. We're not told why. Mark's departure is noted without comment. Uh, we, we just don't know. It's about 150 kilometers by sea, so it may have been an unpleasant uh, journey. Probably not. The uh, summertime, the, the winds are not heavy, and it's often a slow passage, uh, but uh, we're, we're simply not told. Uh, we are told that from Perga, 
Paul went directly to Antioch of Pisidia. Antioch of Pisidia is a different Antioch. Uh, the various Antiochs are named for uh, a, an earlier king by the name of Antiochus, not Antiochus Epiphanes. He was a bad guy, but for another Antiochus. And so Antioch is a fairly common name. Uh, Antioch of Pisidia is a major city in the uh, central Turkish plateau country. Uh, all of Galatia is like central Turkish plateau. It was sparsely populated in antiquity. It still is today. Uh, it's farmland and a relatively dry, open country. Uh, in, uh, in the United States, it looks an awful lot like uh, Montana or Nebraska. Just big sky, wide open spaces. Uh, a, a man on a horse could go all day without meeting anybody. Uh, and uh, Paul was on, uh, on foot. The journey from Perga to Antioch of Pisidia is about 170 kilometers. So this would take a good solid week of, uh, of hard walking. And people ask, why didn't Paul stop at Perga? Perga was a, a, a minor port city. It was, uh, it was a place where there were a good number of people. A church in Perga would have been strategically located. And so why didn't Paul stop in Perga? Two answers come to mind. Uh, one uh, is that there was no synagogue in Perga. Uh, now we're not told that, but Paul tended to stop in places where there was a synagogue. And secondly, uh, Sergius Paulus had relatives in Pisidian Antioch. Uh, so Paul had both a synagogue and a set of contacts in Antioch. He made the strategic decision to plant a church where it might be easier to get it started. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, along the way, we're going to see Paul and Barnabas, and then later Paul and Luke, making decisions on where to stop and where not to stop that are strategic. Uh, Paul picks places, sometimes because it's obviously an excellent strategic location for a church, but often because here there are some Jews or here there are some disciples of John the Baptist. There, there's some reason almost every time. So here they are in Antioch, and he preaches a message on the Sabbath in uh, verses 14 through 41. This is a relatively long speech from Paul. And what Paul is going to do in this particular uh, uh, sermon uh, is to uh, lay out Jewish history leading up to the Messiah. This is the longest synagogue sermon uh, in the book of Acts. Uh, we see several others, uh, but this is the, uh, the long and uh, complex one. Uh, the, uh, uh, the sermon is basically taken from Jewish history. Uh, he uh, uh, speaks of Moses, he speaks of David, he speaks of uh, the Jews being the sons of the family of Abraham, verse 26, to us has been sent the message of this salvation, 27, those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not recognize him, uh, uh, condemned him, and though they found no fault in him, they asked Pilate to have him executed. Verse 30, but God raised him up. You see the similarity to the apostolic preaching so far? You Jews executed the Son of God, but God exalted him, raising him up on the third day. That's core. 
to the gospel message as is being preached by the apostles in the synagogues. You Jews have rejected the disciples, even though the, uh, uh, or you have rejected the prophets, even though those prophets were sent to you to lead you to the Messiah. And when the Messiah came, you rejected him and killed him. Uh, you should repent <laughs> because what you've done is a very bad thing. Verse, uh, verse 32, we bring you good news that what God promised to the fathers, he has fulfilled to us by raising Jesus as it is written. Uh, and, uh, and he goes on, he's quoting from the Psalms and from other places. Uh, down to verse 44. Oh, no, verse 43, many Jews and devout converts followed Paul and Barnabas, who, as they spoke with them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. So there is a ready acceptance. These include Jews and devout converts. Uh, the devout converts would be Gentiles uh, who had become converted to uh, Judaism. Uh, it's... Uh, quite likely that those uh, devout converts would include uh, the, uh, the daughter and son-in-law of Sergius Paulus. Uh, and uh, we, I'm not gonna explain how, how that works, but that, that is true. Uh, the, Gentile response and Jewish opposition begins at verse 44. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered. When the Jews saw the crowd, they were jealous. They began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him, a strong word. And Paul and Barnabas spoke loudly, saying it was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you, the Jews, since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Oh, Paul is just, uh, he, he's looking for ways to get himself crucified is what he's doing here. Uh, you're unworthy of eternal life. You judge yourself and behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. And so the Lord has commanded us saying, I've made you the light to the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Uh, so that's the way it happened. And the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing. I love it. When the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing. There's a Jew-Gentile division uh, in Antioch. Uh, and uh, this seems to be an important part of that. And the word of the Lord began uh, spreading as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. Uh, I, I need to emphasize that little bit. Uh, Luke is uh, picking up on a, uh, on a Paul type of expression. As many as were appointed to eternal life refers to God's appointing. God in eternity past chose some for eternal life. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. Now that faith is the outworking in time of the plan that God has established from eternity past. Uh, I, I love the way the story fits that in. Uh, it, uh, it comes about so naturally. As many as were appointed. Uh, some Christians get, uh, get upset when the Bible starts talking about election and predestination and calling and all of the rest of that foreknowledge, because these are difficult ideas. Uh, but the Bible is not the slightest bit embarrassed about using that language. Uh, the the fact that the Bible keeps coming back to is that God is the king. and He has established his plan uh, for all of the world, for all of eternity. And the salvation of individuals is a part of that. 
Okay, uh, that's, that's going on. And the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the region. But the Jews incited devout women of high standing and leading men stirring up persecution uh, of Ball, uh, Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of the district. But, and this is a common uh, uh, thing, they shook the dust from their feet and went on to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. So this is a transitional verse. They shook the dust off their feet and rejoiced in the spirit that they were counted worthy for a little persecution. Uh, and uh, on they went. And that takes us on into farther to the east, into this area of Turkey. Uh, there's uh, there's not all that much to see anymore. I'm hearing uh, Deborah in the background. Uh, there's not much to see in uh, central Turkey today. This is the general region of Galatia, Iconium, Lystra, Derby. These uh, these cities that are listed in uh, chapter 14. Uh, and here Paul is going to have a ministry. They came in uh, together in verse. Uh, 14, one through five, uh, uh, Iconium is way up high, about, uh, uh, about five kilometers above sea level is uh, 3,300, no, no, not five kilometers, uh, about one kilometer above sea level uh, on the Roman commercial route. Uh, so it's, a, uh, it's an intersection of a couple of roads. And Paul's preaching follows the, the pattern. He goes to the Jews first, uh, when he's rejected there, on to the Gentiles. Uh, there's opposition, violence happens, the missionaries depart. Uh, the usual response that Paul is going to arrive, uh, stir up in these places is stoning. Stoning was a typical punishment for uh, uh, blasphemy uh, or for uh, false teaching. This was this is a fairly common thing, and the Jews would do this every chance they got. So on they went to Iconium. They bore witness of the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the people were divided. Some sided with the Jews, some with the apostles. An attempt was made by both Jews and Gentiles with their rulers to mistreat them and to stone them. They learned of it and fled to Lystra and Derby. So at verse, uh, verse 8, we see them at Lystra and Derby. And this is the first mention of a miracle uh, in the, uh, 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 in the uh, missionary journeys. There have been several times so far when it probably would have been helpful to have a miracle or two. Uh, but uh, we're getting far enough into the apostolic age uh, when the apostolic miracles are less common. Uh, but we're going to see one uh, here in verses 8 through 10. Uh, they uh, uh, found a man sitting who couldn't use his feet, crippled from birth, never walked. He listened to Paul speaking, and Paul, looking intently, seeing that he had faith to be made well, said, stand upright on your feet. And he sprang up and began walking. And all the crowd saw what Paul had done. They lifted up their voices, saying, the gods have come down. And they called Barnabas Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes, because Hermes is the messenger of Zeus. <laughs> And um, uh, Paul and uh, Barnabas said, We're, stop that. <laughs> we are mere men just like you. And uh, the living God who made the heaven and the earth uh, sent us. Uh, and uh, they used this error to try to uh, uh, emphasize the, uh, the, the truth of the gospel. There is a God in heaven who is who is not found in the stone statues that you worship, uh, and it is He that we represent. This is uh, uh, one of the the first uh, options that Paul has to preach directly to the Gentiles uh, without a uh, without a Jewish presence. Now, 
very quickly after that, uh, the uh, the Jews uh, uh, found out what was going on. Uh, it was only with error that or effort that the apostles were able to keep the Gentiles from uh, sacrificing a goat to them. <laughs> Uh, uh, and the Jews eventually came from Antioch and then from Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, they began to stone them. They dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. Okay, this is the first really serious beating that Paul has had. Uh, later on in the Corinthian epistles, Paul talks about uh, being beaten and stoned and left for dead numerous times. This is this is one of those events. Uh, and uh, so from there, uh, the end of uh, chapter 14, beginning at verse 24, they passed through Pisidia, came through Pamphylia. When they had spoken, they went down to Atalia. From there, they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work they had uh, fulfilled. Uh, and so they have accomplished what they set out to do. They went out and preached. Uh, the The whole thing would have taken, oh, the better part of uh, a year, maybe nine months. And, uh, they make it all the way back to uh, Antioch of Syria, where they report on what has been done. This, by the way, is a uh, the standard missionary pattern. Uh, everybody who is a missionary has has a home church or group of churches. Uh, and those churches send them out, and from time to time, missionaries are expected to come back and report what has happened. So back they come to uh, Antioch. Uh, and this is this uh, uh, silver thing that you see in the background is the uh, the famous uh, Antioch chalice. Uh, and uh, the, the Christians at Antioch back in the Middle Ages believed that this was the very cup that Jesus used at the Last Supper. Uh, not likely, but uh, it, it was very famous in the Middle Ages, and the Crusaders were uh, absolutely thrilled uh, when uh, one of the local Arabs sold them this. Uh, nevertheless, this is a symbol of Antioch, and we still see it today. Uh, they came back to Antioch, and that takes us from there to chapter 15. Chapter 15 is the high point of uh, uh, Paul's story. Uh, chapter 15 is the Jerusalem Council. So some men came down from Judea and were t uh, teaching the brothers. This is 15.1. Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now, that's fairly straightforward. Uh, this is presented uh, in Antioch and eventually carried to Jerusalem. And it has to do with the question, uh, under what conditions can the uh, Gentiles become Christians? And the Judaizing party, that's what we call them, uh, were arguing that in order to become Christian, you must become uh, uh, Jewish first. And so at the very least, circumcision has to be imposed on Gentile converts. Well, uh, that, that message was being presented in... Uh, uh, in Antioch, and Paul and Barnabas had no small discussion and debate with them. You can imagine Paul particularly. Uh, Barnabas would most likely have been looking for some kind of a middle ground, uh, but Paul, as you probably noticed by this time, wants nothing to do with middle ground. Uh, he would have been calling these people spawn of the devil, the, uh, uh, evil men out of the pit of hell. I, I don't know what he what he said, but he, he would have made his position fairly clear. Uh, this issue is going to be central to the history of the early church. If Christianity uh, had taken the route of, uh, of making everyone Jewish first, it would have been a much smaller movement. 
uh, for a lot of reasons, uh, not not merely the inconvenience, but there would have been a uh, there would have been a lot of trouble with that, uh, and the the gospel message doesn't support that uh, that sort of idea. It just doesn't take us there. Uh, so, what shall we do? The argument uh, is essentially theological. How can the Gentiles ignore the covenant law of the Old Testament? How can believers who are observant of the law sit at the same table, the potluck supper, uh, a, a bunch of people around a table eating chicken adobo with those who are not covenant keeping Jews? How can you do that? It was uh, the, the question of ritual uncleanness comes up. The problem of Gentile associations with idolatry are clearly in view. It was a bad thing in general uh, because the Jewish tradition is that the Gentiles are kind of dirty people. They're unclean. They're not nice people. They, they worship idols and they eat meat sacrificed to idols. And it's just icky to be around them. Uh, it's a um, uh, it's a kind of racism, uh, and uh, really not a very nice thing, uh, and uh, it's actually very 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 important. So, uh, circumcision uh, comes down to the uh, to the bottom of the discussion. The Judaizing party says they've got to be circumcised. This is the covenant sign, and this is the absolute minimum of obedience to God goes back, they say, before the Mosaic law, all the way to Abraham. Paul argues uh, both here and later, very significantly in the little uh, book of Galatians, that circumcision is unnecessary, that salvation is by faith, by means of the grace of God without the works of the law. And by the works of the law, Paul means uh, all of the obedience to the law, including uh, covenant obligations that are good things uh, and were object lessons of, uh, of Jewish faith. Uh, the uh, circumcision was a good thing, not an evil thing. Uh, but Paul says this good thing is not necessary uh, for the Gentile world. Well, uh, this wasn't going to be solved at uh, Antioch. The problem was significant enough that one church alone shouldn't decide it. And on this, they all agreed. And a meeting was called in Jerusalem. This is, this is really an important thing. This is... Um, the first real church council. It's not quite a council in the in the same sense as the later uh, church councils, which were uh, were called with hierarchical authority and bishops and all of the rest. It's more of a consultation. The leaders of the church, the apostles, uh, and the key pastors, and other people who have an uh, an important point to make got together to discuss the issue and try to arrive at a common position. Uh, a consensus really is what they were after. Uh, this is, I believe, the, the standard for a church council. Uh, when there's a big issue facing the church, uh, you'll notice it's not decided by all of the people getting together in a great big group is decided by uh, the elders, the pastors, the leaders, the missionaries, the, the apostles, uh, the, the key players, those who have demonstrated by a life of ministry that uh, they actually have what it takes to contribute something to the conversation. Those are the people who are involved. Uh, and uh, not as uh, masters or uh, 
uh, elite lords over the church, but as those with the experience and the background uh, to have something important to say about the issues. Uh, I think, again, that this is important for us today. Okay, so there they were, and the, the timing of the event is uh, uh, debated by the scholars. Uh, the, uh, uh, the relation of uh, some of the verses to uh, Galatians 2 uh, is uh, uh, argued about uh, most conservatives date the council to either 48 or 49 AD, some dated as early as 46. Uh, uh, there's at least one that I know whose opinion I trust, uh, who dates it as late as 50 AD. Uh, it's traditional amongst uh, church historians to speak of the Jerusalem Council of 50 AD, uh, but recognize it could be plus or minus a few years. Uh, and uh, it, it depends on how we organize some of the other chronological details. But that gives us a general time frame around 50 AD. So this is roughly 20 years after uh, the time of Christ, uh, between 17 and 20 years, depends on how you date the uh, crucifixion. Uh, so that's that's all of this. The, uh, the passage here as we get into the council is going to recount the events that lead it up uh, that have led the church to discern what God was desiring. The discussion is an interaction between what God has clearly done and what the scriptures clearly say. Uh, it, in both cases, we're looking at hard evidence. Here's what the Bible actually says. You, you know, you're saved by grace through faith and that not of yourself, it's a gift of God. And here's what's actually happened when we went to Caesarea, when we went uh, to the Samaritans, when we went to Antioch uh, and the Paul and Barnabas relating what had happened in, uh, uh, in Galatia and on Cyprus. Uh, here's what's happening amongst the Gentiles. None of them uh, uh, were circumcised, and yet it's obvious to us that the Spirit of God was working among them. Uh, uh, so the uh, the uh, church council, whatever their theological positions, had to come to grips with what was actually happening on the ground, uh, and uh, they uh, they came to a conclusion. Uh, they uh, they needed to, it had to happen, and they came to a solution which is a compromise, acceptable to both Jewish conscience and the need to include the Gentiles. Uh, it was obvious that the Gentiles were going to be a part of the church, and the conversation came down to, let's not put any bigger burden on the Gentiles than we have to. Why should we put a burden on them that is greater than uh, we've ever put on ourselves? Uh, this is a very hard thing. Um, and so they, they come to some conclusions about not, not eating meat sacrificed to idols or blood or uh, uh, strangled things, uh, which wouldn't be all that hard for anybody to live with. On the larger uh, stage, I suspect Paul wasn't entirely happy with the solution, but he accepted it as a workable compromise for the whole community. Somehow, Jews and Gentiles are going to have to come together and work together in the growing church. It was going to have to be, uh, it was just going to have to be significantly uh, later on, Paul never mentions the decrees that come out of this meeting, even in places in some of his letters where it would have been practical. Uh, I, I, and I'm not sure what's going on here, except to say that Paul seems to be happy letting the members of the Jerusalem Council spread this message their own way. So the party of the circumcision 
had been insisting on circumcision uh, and law keeping and the Gentiles were supposed to become proselytes, actual Jews. The council decision makes it clear that they recognize that a, a, a title change has taken place. There's a new economy in place. And so a new approach to God's administration of salvation. The, the point is clear. Uh, and uh, uh, those of us who are uh, of this line of thinking call this a dispensational change, a change in the economy. Uh, we have shifted from the mosaic economy or the economy of the law to an economy of grace uh, or the church age. Uh, the book of Acts is in many ways the chronicle of that shift. So there's a, there's a meeting and a whole lot of stuff is going on. Peter has a long message uh, in verses 7 through 11. Uh, he really wants this to uh, all come together. Uh, uh, Peter has a lot to say about grace, which is important. Uh, Barnabas and Paul give their testimony. And significantly, James, who represents the Jewish church in Jerusalem and is the brother of Jesus, makes the concluding statement. Uh, this is in verses 13 through 21. Uh, he essentially notes that the Gentiles as a people uh, are going to represent God in the world. Uh, he will speak uh, through them to the rest of the world. He quotes from the prophets. Uh, he puts a minimum burden on the Gentiles. And everybody agrees. Uh, the conclusion of the council is that salvation is a matter of grace and faith, requiring no particular work of the law. The works of the law are not evil. Uh, the Jews who become Christians are welcome to continue uh, with their traditions, but they are no longer required. And Christian fellowship means that uh, grace should be shown over our differences. If we're going to hold different opinions about some matters, we ought to hold those opinions graciously and not beat up on one another over things that aren't central. Now, I consider some things central. Salvation by grace through faith is central. If you deny that, I've got a problem. Uh, but if you believe that in addition to salvation by grace through faith, uh, Christians in all ethical righteousness ought to follow Jewish law, I'm okay with that as long as you don't insist on it for me. Uh, if there's something you want to add to the gospel uh, as, a, uh, as a traditional extra, I'm fine with that. Uh, you know, I don't care what music we sing. I don't care how often we do the Lord's Supper. Uh, I don't care what we believe about the rapture. There's all kinds of things that don't matter. And this council is apparently saying, guys, let's, let's hold our church together on the basis of the things that really matter. All of this was put together in a letter that was going to be sent out uh, first to Antioch and then to any other church that that wanted to join. Uh, that's the, uh, the response. The people in Antioch, beginning at verse 30, responded with joy. The brethren were comforted, which means they settled down. Nobody was angry anymore. Uh, they were going to settle down for a while. And what Luke is proclaiming here is that Gentile Christianity is free from the law and that the unity of the church has been preserved. There will not be a Jewish church and a Gentile church. We're all in this together. I think there's a, there's a principle there that is, uh, uh, is still incumbent on all of us. Uh, to the extent that it is possible, we ought to cooperate 
with everyone who claims to be Christian until they make it impossible. Uh, there are some groups I can't work with, uh, but generally speaking, uh, as Christians, we ought to try to be on the same team and work together. We ought to find ways uh, when it can be done. Okay, this takes us from uh, chapter 15 all the way to the end of chapter 15, and we get the, uh, uh, the conclusion of, uh, of book five, the confirmation of the churches in Asia Minor. Uh, here, Paul is going to go off into uh, Asia Minor again, uh, which is actually the beginning of Paul's second missionary journey. Uh, they have a discussion over Mark, and uh, Barnabas and Saul uh, separate. Barnabas is heading for Cyprus. Saul is going to go on uh, for Tarsus with his uh, friend Silas, and off they go to South Galatia, and we're told then in verse 5 that this concludes book 5, and the churches were strengthened in the faith and they increased in numbers daily. When we get back together on Wednesday, uh, we're going to look at Paul's second missionary journey and the way that the, uh, the, uh, the message of the gospel is taken on to Europe. It's a very big deal uh, because we, we see this, this spreading word. Paul's apostolic ministry involves sharing the gospel any place he has an opportunity to, uh, and then letting the individual churches grow. And the individual churches will grow. Some of them better than others. Some will have ups and downs. But the church, operating under the power of God's Spirit, will continue to grow. And that's the promise of the book of Acts. Okay, we're going to uh, we're going to knock off here, and we'll see you on uh, on Wednesday. <laughs> and uh, we've got all of the uh, the feedback loops going around. <laughs> it's good to hear everybody. Good to see everybody. Uh, we'll uh, we'll see you again on Wednesday. Bye bye everybody. Love you. Bye. Thank you, Doctor Jan. Thank you, Doctor Jan. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Uh, see you, uh, All right. Bye. Good night. Good night. Uh, Oscar, we'll see you in just a few minutes on Facebook.